One caveat before I start is that I, I have the privilege of spending uh, a lot of my time traveling to speak. And I have a particular heart for trying to go to places where most of the drugs that we use in the United States are not available. So I spend a lot of time in Latin America and certain parts of uh, Europe and Asia where I've come to appreciate what it is to treat patients with very little. As I was mentioning to someone this morning, I originally came from Canada, and when I left Canada eight and a half years ago, our standard frontline therapy for myeloma was high-dose dexamethasone alone. We couldn't even get thalidomide frontline. Uh, we couldn't get doxel frontline. Uh, so we had very few options. So I know sometimes it can be frustrating when you read papers or you see a talk by an American physician saying, oh, just use this combination. Well, it's a nice thing to say, but when you don't have access to it, what can you do? So I'm going to spend a little less time today just telling you about all these different drugs uh, that you don't have access to and more about our thinking of the disease and our understanding of it. And then, as I say, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit more about those. So my objectives then for these next 45 minutes or so is to review the pathophysiology of multiple myeloma and its therapeutic implications. Our even definition of the disease has changed, and so we'll outline some of those in the diagnostic criteria. I had the privilege of being here yesterday and speaking to a large group of students, and I was showing to them how we've changed our thinking of this disease. We used to always define myeloma based on the presence of crab features. Well, now we'll show to you that even before some of those features make manifest, patients can truly have myeloma. Now we'll talk about some prognostic factors and specifically how it moves us to risk stratification. You know, if you held a day like this, like you've held, and I think this is marvelous that you devote a whole day to myeloma, it makes myeloma geeks like me very excited. Uh, but if you had a whole day like this to lymphoma, you wouldn't expect everyone to speak about lymphoma in the same way. It's a big difference between Burkitt's lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, and non-Hodgkin's, and, and uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We know there's a huge spectrum of disease. Well, similarly in myeloma, I hope by the end of this lecture, you'll come to appreciate that there really isn't one kind of myeloma. It's multiple for a reason. That there are various types of myeloma, from some that are extremely benign to extremely uh, aggressive. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, I was asked to cover a little bit about initial therapy, so we'll talk about some of the, the treatments and the approaches that we take in initial therapy. And then I'll close off by just looking a little bit ahead to the future. And this is a disease that we have really changed its natural course uh, in many places on the planet. Our database and our registry would support that in the last decade, we have tripled the average survival of patients. The patients who do not have high-risk features, for example, that I'll show you in a moment, we expect those patients to live now more than 10 years, something unheard of, even just a few years ago in the world of myeloma. And it's because of things like stem cell transplantation and some of these new drugs that we're going to talk about. So again, I could give you a really long and boring lecture on pathobiology because it, it excites people like me. And it's too early in the morning and you haven't had enough coffee yet to listen to that. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I am going to just note a couple of things on a couple of slides. Point number one, it's not just about myeloma. And this is true of all cancers, but I would say it's much more so in the realm of myeloma. What do I mean by that? It's more than the plasma cell. We think of the plasma cell as being the centerpiece of myeloma, and of course it is. But it's not just the sheer presence of that plasma cell. It's that plasma cell's ability to communicate and take over its environment. I used the example yesterday with the students that if there's an enemy who goes into the building across the street, it's one thing for the enemy to be present in the building, but it's one thing if that enemy can marshal all the resources of that building, the power, the air conditioning, the lights, the Wi-Fi, the water. Now, all those things make that enemy that much more powerful. And sometimes it's a very small enemy. I was just talking to the, to the chair of our department the day I left to come here, uh, the day before I left to come here, that we want to look at, in our database, we have a series of patients who have never had more than 5% plasma cells. So in a sense, they don't meet the formal criteria for myeloma, but we know that they have myeloma, right? I don't know if you have the same expression here in Indonesia, but we say, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and smells like a duck, it's a duck. Right? So some things are pretty obvious. So this patient, these patients 
clearly have myeloma, but they just don't have more than 10% plasma cells, to remind us that even a small amount of plasma cells can be very aggressive. The extreme version of this is POEMS syndrome. I don't know how often you've seen POEMS syndrome. For the students and residents here, you know that's an acronym, P-O-E-M-S. And if you don't know what it is, well, there's always dentistry for you. No, no, you, you, can, uh, you, you can look it up later. But this is a disease characterized by a tiny clone, a very few. Most patients with POEMS genuinely have maybe 2 to 3% plasma cells at max. But we want to look at people who've had that small amount and see how aggressive the disease can be. And so point number one is it's not just about the myeloma cell, it's about all of its interactions with the environment around it, with the uh, bone marrow stromal cells, which is probably the most important partner that myeloma has, but also other cells like osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So I try to express it this way in this schematic, which I think is one of my favorite, because it not only tells you about the interaction, it shows you that there are so many targets. Because again, like I, I said to the students yesterday, if I can't get into that building, right? You know, America is known sometimes for just going in and blowing up the whole building, all right? Sometimes it's a little bit damaging. But if I want to get rid of the enemy, instead of blowing up the whole building, if I know the enemy is on the third floor, why don't I just turn off the power to the third floor? Wouldn't that be much more convenient? And so this is what we're trying to do now, is with all of these pathways and all of these signals, we're developing drugs and developing tools to understand how this disease works. So some of the drugs that I'll mention at the end of the talk are drugs, for example, that engage T cells. There's going to be very interesting data soon to be presented at the American Society of Hematology meeting looking at CAR T cell therapy for myeloma. That day has come. And you'll see some very impressive work there, even if you're not at the meeting, of course, by accessing it online. The abstracts are going to be available this week for you. Uh, it's going to be very impressive. We also have drugs that, in, that can engage natural killer cells. We have drugs that target interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor and all of these other uh, complex interactions that we see. Now, one of the features that I think is really important, so we said it's more than just the plasma cell. It's the plasma cell's ability to interact with its local environment. But in a bigger scale, what I like to say is the balcony view. One of the reasons why the whole world of cancer is particularly interested in immunotherapy right now is that we're starting to better understand the role of the immune system in cancer. I like this schematic uh, uh, from this paper that was published almost 10 years ago now because it simplifies it for someone with a simple brain like me to try and understand this. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is in a moment I'm going to show to you, of course, the pathogenic changes that we see from a patient who goes from MGUS to smoldering myeloma to myeloma. Now, more often than not, this happens below our radar. It happens without seeing. Uh, we were talking in the car on the way here that we don't see a lot of MGUS in Indonesia. Well, it's probably because you're not looking for it. Do you remember the old adage in medicine? If you don't take a temperature, the patient won't have a fever. Right? It doesn't mean the patient doesn't have a fever. It just means you haven't measured it. Right? So there are probably, and I joked with the students yesterday, I wasn't trying to scare them, that there are probably at least five people in this room who have a monoclonal protein if I look for it. Now, I'm not setting up my own booth outside, and I'm not drawing any blood from anybody. Uh, that's not, it's not that kind of meeting. Uh, but, um, but the reality is, this is very common and prolific. However, the overwhelming majority of people on this planet who have a monoclonal protein will never be sick from it. So how is it that this monoclonal protein goes from being slightly bad to very bad, right? How does it go in the, the way I describe it to patients in the clinic? I say it's like finding a little bit of dust in the corner. If you look for it, oh, yes, there's a bit of dust there. But if you didn't go looking, you'd say, wow, they keep nice clean floors here at the faculty. But you don't want that dust to grow and grow and grow and start affecting the room. So there are three mechanisms or three E's. They all start with the letter E that can help us understand this. Number one is cancer through its immunoediting or immune system without therapy is elimination. So the body is constantly vigilantly looking for any sign of malignancy. And often, even before it becomes a problem, it puts out the fire. We probably underappreciate how important that is. And in multiple myeloma, we, where patients have perhaps the weakest immune system of almost any malignancy that we treat, 
those regular mechanisms of cancer elimination are drastically reduced. This is the role of the police officer to just, just keep peace. The sheer presence of the police officers that sometimes will prevent crimes from occurring. Because people look and say, oh yeah, I better not do anything wrong. Right? Point number two, the next step, is what's called cancer equilibrium. This is where there is some crime going on, there is some cancer present, but somehow the body finds a way to keep it in sync. I think this is a mechanism that I would like to understand a lot better in myeloma. Why is that? Myeloma, as you know, is one of the few cancers that we can have the disease present, but it's not hurting the patient, and we don't treat it. Smoldering myeloma, monoclonal gammopathies, we don't treat those. As you know, we just watch them. Somehow the body develops an equilibrium with it. Now, paradoxically, we have some patients who never go into a complete remission from their myeloma, but they live very long with the disease. If I look at the Mayo database of patients who have lived more than 10 or 15 years with myeloma, almost 20% of them have never truly had a complete remission. And I have to believe that when we restore them back to an MGUS-like state, they somehow get into an equilibrium. That sometimes a little bit of the disease somehow keeps the balance. By contrast, if you have a patient who goes into absolute complete remission, but then relapses quickly, that's a very bad situation. Perhaps the most important prognostic marker in myeloma is the time to first relapse. When someone first relapses, that can be a problem. And so with the, the work, the folks in Arkansas have shown very good work that in fact it's worse to have achieved complete remission and relapse quickly than it is to never have achieved complete remission. I joke with the fellows and students and say, is it better to have had love and lose it than to have never had love? You know, that's your decision, right? But, but the point is here that it's awful to have had that depth of response and biologically the disease grow back very quickly. There's no equilibrium there. And then, of course, that's what's happening. The third E is cancer escape. And this is where there's just no ability of the immune system to keep the disease down anymore. And like a fire, it becomes a bonfire and takes over the immune system, and that's what we see happening in myeloma. Okay, I promise less science now, and uh, less uh, basic science now, and a little bit more clinical. So Bob Kyle from Mayo Clinic, uh, many years ago now, has, was able to show that there are different steps along the way that convert a normal cell into a, a monoclonal gammopathy plasma cell into a myeloma cell. We don't understand what all these mechanisms are, but clinically, you and I know that we can see this in practice. And we see it by various means and by various uh, methods. Clinically, to be very basic, the three most important factors that will predict the progression of MGUS to myeloma are these. Number one, the size of the M spike. If it's greater than 1.5 grams per deciliter, that's a high risk point. Number two, the type. If it's a non-IgG type, that's the high-risk feature. If it's IgG, it's lower risk. But if it's IgA or M, that's high risk. Or IgD, although that's rare. And then lastly, the free light chain ratio. If the ratio is abnormal, that's high risk, of course. If it's, not, uh, if it's normal, then it's lower risk. And so based on that, patients either have zero, one, two, or three of these factors. And that significantly influences their 20-year risk of progression towards myeloma. If I tell an 80-year-old patient that they have no risk factors, that they have a 5% chance by the time they turn 100 of developing myeloma, that's a pretty good risk. On the other hand, a 40-year-old in my practice who has a 60% chance of developing myeloma in the next 20 years is someone we have to watch a little bit more closely. And so sure enough, even though the risk is fairly stagnant for MGUS, there's a higher risk for those patients that have come to smoldering myeloma. And smoldering myeloma is one important step along this pathway where ultimately the disease can become extra medullary, which is really the most dangerous side of myeloma. This is where the enemy doesn't only live in the building across the street. The enemy has its own backpack of resources. It has portable Wi-Fi. It has portable energy. It's got its own resource that it can go anywhere. When you start finding patients that have disease outside the medulla, then we run into trouble. And so, to help understand this, clinically, uh, a group of us felt that we had to redefine myeloma. What I mean by that is, historically, we said 
you have MGUS if you have less than 10% plasma cells and no crab. You have smoldering if you have more than 10% plasma cells but no crab. And you have myeloma if you have crab. Right? You show me the crab, right? You've got to be anemic. I'm sorry, your hemoglobin's not low enough. I'm sorry, not until you break a bone am I going to treat you. Obviously, part of that doesn't really make sense. Sometimes I like to say, if you see your friend running off to a cliff and about to fall down a cliff, do you have to wait until they're falling to know they're in trouble? No. But if the cliff is miles and miles away and the, patient, and the person is not uh, running towards it very quickly, then you can wait and watch. So what we've done now is we've added three criteria, greater than 60% plasma cells in the barrel, a ratio or an involved over uninvolved uh, ratio of greater than 100 of the light chain. Or, I know it's not always easily done, but if we do an MRI of the marrow and see focal lesions as opposed to the normal homogeneous pattern, if any of these three are present, you have to consider the patient to have active multiple myeloma. Because we've been able to show, and I won't bore you with the data, we've been able to show that these three circumstances will lead patients to have a significantly higher risk of active disease even within a few months, if not a year. So we've taken this ultra high risk, what we used to call ultra high risk smoldering myeloma, these three factors, and we've pulled it over into the myeloma camp. So now I like to joke and say we call it slim crab instead of crab. So you can remember slim by the S, L, I, and M as those three features that we've, uh, we've added. And those patients should be treated uh, and don't have to be uh, uh, simply monitored any longer. So I've tried to just summarize this in a simple table for you. And by the way, I will more than gladly provide my slides to you. I have no copyright. I reference all of my slides. I am very much into the dissemination of information. So I will gladly provide them to Susan and she can uh, provide them for you. But feel free to take pictures if you wish. But I will provide the slides to you. And this just summarizes much of what we've said already. So for time's sake, I won't go through it in much more detail. So uh, when we think of... Uh, the heterogeneity of myeloma, as I've mentioned, biologically and clinically, we, we have this huge spectrum. And this behooves us to think a little bit about what we might call risk stratification, where we can define what is higher risk versus more standard risk. And these are based on the uh, prognostic factors that we have. So I have a little difficulty moving ahead. So the IMWG, or the International Myeloma Working Group that I'm a part of, we had a consensus statement on how to define these. And basically, um, as you'll see, the higher risk patients are those that have higher risk ISS scores or, and or um, uh, cytogenetic features that we know can confer a poor prognosis to patients. And look at the difference in the median overall survival. That in standard risk patients, it's seven years, but it can be as low as two years in high risk and over 10 years in true low risk. Well, it's, it's hard always to, to make sure we have all, oops, sorry, that we have all of these numbers, but we have to ask ourselves, why do we do this? Is this just some academic thing so I can come to Indonesia and look smart when I tell you about all of these different features that we have? No, this is actually practical for patients. I would suggest that it affects prognosis. Often for us, it influences clinical trial selection. So I have a trial right now, we'll be presenting it at ASH, where patients can qualify only if they have the translocation 1114. Because we know that the drug works on the BCL2 pathway, which is uh, uh, obviously a part of uh, translocation 1114. Now there's some controversy, I won't go through this in a lot of detail. There's some differences between what we've said at my Mayo Clinic and what the International Myeloma Working Group has said. But really at the end of the day, we have very common features. And that is to say, when patients have translocation 414, we really want to use a proteasome inhibitor. When patients have high-risk disease, we really have to push towards a deeper and a sustained response. Those are the patients that if you take your foot off the gas, you're going to be in trouble. You have to constantly be pushing this disease down or else it is going to come back and it can come back very aggressively. So we can risk stratify by the tumor clone, by the patient themselves, by the two of these together. And so as you probably have known now, we recently updated the old international staging system that used just two features, beta-2 microglobulin and albumin, and we've um, Im improved it now uh, in light of cytogenetic changes uh, that we know are so influential to put those two together uh, plus 
the um, uh, LDH, as you see here, into this combined system. So now we have what's called the RISS, or the Revised International Staging System, where we take the ISS plus any cytogenetic features that may be high or low risk, plus the LDH, and people ultimately land in these, uh, in these groups. Um, and you can see how much it influences their prognosis as to whether or not patients are in this um, uh, RISS stage one, stage two, or stage three grouping where uh, the, the, uh, the long-term survival is significantly different between them. So, um, for, sorry, this is really having difficulty advancing today. We may need a new battery. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So we have tried uh, to summarize how we would approach this with our so-called M-SMART. I'm not saying that we're that smart, uh, but that's just the word that we came up with, and you can look it up yourself at msmart.org anytime you wish. Um, but what we've tried to do is we've tried to divide patients into these three risk categories based on the features that you see here, of which the most important is the deletion 17P in high risk, the translocation 414 in intermediate risk, and hyperdiploidy in standard risk. The majority of patients still are in standard risk. 60% of patients are still standard risk. If we look at just the last decade of data, when I published this a couple of years ago, the average survival of standard risk patients was 8 to 10 years, but we were still only about 3 years in the high risk group. We're making some progress there, but we have much more work to do to try and make this better. Next slide, please. And so what we've done uh, is now decided on treatment modalities based on these risk factors. Now, I mentioned this earlier. I know that you don't have all these drugs available to you. I'm less interested in telling you about the drugs and more about the concept. So the concept here is that in high-risk disease, people should be given the most aggressive regimen that we think we know works best in myeloma, which is the combination of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, sometimes called KRD. We transplant them, and then they go on to a more aggressive maintenance regimen. Whereas in standard-risk patients, we still give them combination therapy but we can have a choice if, if we go to stem cell transplant right away or potentially defer it, and then their maintenance strategy is a little lighter, is not quite as aggressive. That's the principle uh, of MSMART and how it influences how we treat both patients who are eligible for transplant and patients who are ineligible for transplant, where again, the timing and the follow-up differs based on their risk status. Again, I'm not going to go through these in great detail. I just wanted to give you a sense of it. When patients have relapse disease, we add one more feature. If a patient relapses within a year of transplant, that's always a bad thing. That's always a challenging situation. Uh, and so again, based on whether or not they're on maintenance or not, whether they're fit or not fit per se, uh, uh, patients or with indolent relapse, we have all these different options. And again, I'm not gonna go through them in a lot of detail, apart from to say we're using Perhaps the, the greatest trend in myeloma right now is to use more combination therapy than single agent. Kind of like what we do in, in HIV st uh, therapy. We don't just use one super drug. It's the combination that works better. And the combination is often a partnership between a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib, or I think here it's called foncozomib, and a and a imid like thalidomide or lenalidomide. What we're soon to start seeing is the other partner, the monoclonal antibody, is also becoming a very good partner. And the monoclonal antibody can partner with either of those two, or in particular, all three together. And we're going to start to see more studies combining monoclonal antibodies, proteasome inhibitors, and immune modulatory drugs all together. So I, I put these slides in for your reference, but we have options and suggestions for patients that have more uh, aggressive relapses later on. I'll leave those for you. So... Interim lessons before our last uh, 10 uh, minutes or so that we have together. Myeloma is not a single disease. It's a very complex disease, as we can see, with a wide spectrum of prognosis. Risk stratification doesn't only influence prognosis, it actually influences our treatment. And as much as possible, we encourage it. Now, I know here in Indonesia it's difficult to obtain cytogenetic studies. Very few centers do it. But we can look at some of those clinical features, as we've said like the ISS plus the LDH, even if one can't fully do the RISS,
with cytogenetics. <clears throat> and so including some kind of risk factor assessment in your diagnostic workup becomes uh, particularly important. Now if you'll allow me, let's just take a diversion for five minutes and tell you about something that I think helps, appreciate, helps us appreciate the pathogenesis of this disease, something that we call clonal evolution. We did serial genomic analyses of 28 patients. To give you a sense, this is a massive amount of work that we did for these 28 patients. I'm not going to go through a lot of, of detail. But we showed that there were three patterns. There are patients whose disease remains genetically stable over the course of their treatment and therapy. There are patients that have so-called linear evolution, meaning the, drug beca the disease becomes resistant to one drug, and then you have to use another drug and it becomes more resistant and if you will, becomes just consistently, like going up steps, becomes more resistant with time. But then we had a few patients that have um, what we might call clonal mixtures. And there's one patient in particular that I want to share with you, because if you understand the concepts here, you have, I think, a better understanding of the disease. So this is a patient who had a high risk, or at least intermediate risk myeloma by virtue of the translocation 414. And in red here, we have the IgA level. Uh, you know, sometimes with IgA myeloma, it's hard to follow the M spike because it's lost in the beta region. So the IgA is sometimes the best way to follow patient. And initially, she looks like a fairly typical myeloma patient. She responded to initial therapy, stayed in remission for quite a while, but then started to progress, and her remissions were getting shorter and shorter. But the first thing you notice here is that there's something bizarre. When her disease became extremely aggressive, sadly, towards the end of her life, her IgA level didn't go up anymore. By contrast, what's in blue is her light chain. Her light chain skyrocketed up. So there was some kind of biological change in this patient. Sometimes we call this light chain escape. And, and we don't fully understand what happens in the biology of the myeloma, but we know that a patient, I just actually admitted a patient last week to hospital who came in with rip-roaring relapse of his myeloma. But you know, his myeloma blood work doesn't look that bad. As I teach the fellows, look at the patient, not at the blood, right? I mean, the blood is important, of course, but you have to look at the patient. And he has developed what we call oligosecretory myeloma, meaning that even though the M spike doesn't go up as high as it used to, it can still be very aggressive. Well, to summarize it, we've created this slide that's become quite famous now. Uh, next slide, please. Where we've been able to show in this patient that at diagnosis, she actually had multiple clones present. She didn't just have one malignant plasma cell or, 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 or set of plasma cells. She had multiple. So now notice the first one was or, uh, red. There's the dominant one is red. She has an orange clone, a green clone, and you can probably not even see it really, but there's this tiny little blue clone. And notice over the course of her treatments that there is what we sometimes even call clonal tiding, like the tiding of the ocean, that different clones become the dominant clone. Sadly, she ultimately died of this blue clone that was present at the start. So what does this all mean, and what might there be for clinical implications of this Next slide, please. That we see that multiple clones were present at the same time, often with varying drug sensitivity. I'm sorry, I, the advancer's not working. So if you could keep advancing, please. So this is perhaps why combination therapy has been so important. That if, we, if you have various weeds in the lawn, you need to use different weed killers together to get rid of those weeds. That's how I explain it to patients. Secondly, we see the re-emergence of drug-sensitive clones. So we used to tell patients, oh, I'm sorry, your disease became uh, resistant to doxyl, or your disease became resistant to thalidomide, we can never go back to that. Is that true? Maybe we can go back to something that we've used before. And it also gives uh, logic to the notion of constantly suppressing the patient. I mentioned that one of the major trends of myeloma right now is combining drugs together. The other trend is to keep treatment for as long as possible. Now that drugs are much more uh, tolerable, now that we have drugs with less cytopenias, with less neuropathy, we can treat people for longer. And so this is one of the effects of suppressive therapy. 
The other point that I think is sad but important is that this minor drug, uh, this, this minor clone can be very lethal. That poor woman died of the blue clone. Wouldn't it have been nice at her diagnosis to eliminate the blue clone? That's what we would, uh, would have wanted to do, but ultimately she succumbed to. And lastly, this is a bit of a controversial question, but especially when patients have high-risk disease, it's apparent that their genome is very unstable. So could we be doing more damage than good by giving people high-powered chemotherapy, uh, like DNA damaging agents? Are we enhancing some of that genomic instability? We don't know, but we'll see. So I wanted to just take you on that little, next slide please, clonal evolution trip uh, to just give you a sense of uh, our better understanding uh, of the biology. Now, as we treat patients, do we just say, all right, I want to find the regimen that works the best. I just want to find the best combination, and that's what I'm going to do. And as you see here, over the years, we have now regimens that in green have almost a 100% response rate. But you know that comes with a challenge on the next slide, that yes, we see increasing response rates, but it comes at a price. Now, I know money is, the price of drugs is very different here in Indonesia than in the United States. But from a relative standpoint, we were using something like RD or Cybor-D, which was very expensive at 100,000 US dollars a year. But imagine now some of these newer combinations are $250,000 a year. That's not sustainable, is it, in the long run? And so we have to think about how we choose those. And I'm very interested in the discussion that we're going to have later around the cost of therapy to know that this is, this is a complicated uh, phenomenon and we, we can't underestimate its value. So for frontline therapy up until this year, we knew that Cybor-D was quite common. Oral cyclophosphamide, bortezomib or, or Velcade or Foncozomib, I think as it's called here, um, and dexamethasone. But the other one that was very commonly used was bortezomib with thalidomide. And then very often we used CTD or cyclophosphamide thalidomide dex. Uh, frontline therapy. Uh, other places, of course, would use VAD, which I know is something you use commonly here in, in Indonesia. In the United States, by contrast, we used a lot of VRD and still use a lot of VRD, and transplant is recommended. Has this changed over this last year? Well, I'll walk you through a few studies. One is whether you fully believe it or not, there are some flaws to the study, but it does appear that combining a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID VTD is superior to VCD. And in this French study, they enrolled nearly uh, 350 patients that were randomized to VTD versus VCD. I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail, apart to say that there was a difference in the response rate favoring VTD. And they concluded that this was, uh, uh, despite the fact that it did induce more neuropathy, that this was something that uh, should be looked at and considered for frontline therapy. Now, meanwhile, in the United States, we were doing a lot of bortezomib and lenalidomide and dexamethasone. The Americans don't like to use thalidomide as much for lots of reasons, including uh, the risk of neuropathy. And it ultimately led to a, a very large clinical trial comparing lenalidomide dexamethasone to bortezomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. And what was important with this study is it included younger and older patients. So it included patients that would or would not have gone to autologous stem cell transplant. And I have to tell you, it's never a shock. Three is better than two if three is tolerable. Four is better than three if three is tolerable. Uh, uh, five is better than four if the five are tolerable. That's where we have to start asking the questions. Do I really need all these drugs? And in a, in a place like Indonesia, I would say this is particularly important because we have a tremendous risk of over-treating patients. So it's the, the classic alpha-beta error. If you over-treat, you can cause more toxicity and cost. If you under-treat, you can grow a more aggressive disease. But of course, the response rate was superior, and this ultimately translated into a progression-free and even overall survival difference. So in a place like the United States, this was quite convincing that VRD was better than RD. I'll skip over their conclusions just for time's sake, as I described most of it. And then lastly, there was the study of, well, if these drugs are so good, maybe we don't need transplant anymore. And I remember when this study was designed, because I was, I was one of the reviewers of this, and there were people who said, this is going to be the end of transplants. 
in myeloma. Well, quite the opposite happened, as some of you know. Now, again, I appreciate that you can't do a transplant here in Yogyakarta, and it's difficult to do transplants in the country. But this study basically compared people getting RVD alone versus RVD plus transplant. And the short version was transplant added to their depth of response and transplant uh, 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 contributed to an improvement in their progression-free survival. And this is not a shock again, like I said before. Three is going to be better than two and four is going to be better than three. So this, I think, still tells us that if the patient is able, if the patient is eligible, if the circumstances are such, the transplant is still um, uh, a standard of care in multiple myeloma. Next slide, please. This is just the progression-free survival curve, a Kaplan-Meier curve, for that same study. So we'll skip the, the conclusions. And I'll show you that we did a study where we wanted to try to see if we could take the base uh, cyclophosphamide thalidomide dex and make it better by adding carfilzomib. And just again on the same theme, we gave these four drugs together. We know that this is a costly regimen, but we found that even with just four cycles of therapy, 91% of patients responded and uh, over two-thirds of them developed very good partial remission. So I think it's heralding a day where we're going to see more and more uh, uh, upfront complicated uh, large th uh, um, combinations in multiple myeloma. I'm sorry, it's very frustrating to not be able to move my slides. Let's just skip this slide, please. Thank you. So last, the, the last study I'm going to show you is now, if that was true of bortezomib lenalidomide dex, is it also true of carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone? And um, this study tried to show the very same concept. Let's just keep advancing the slides, please. Um, that they would give this combination without transplant and give it with transplant. And sure enough, the response was better patients had the transplant than when they did not. This was early on and over time, even in stringent complete remission. It affected progression-free survival, but a little bit too early to influence overall survival. We're now waiting in the next six months to have the results of the KRD versus VRD study. This will be very important because I suspect this will influence whether or not uh, which of these two will be the most commonly used regimen uh, in the future. Next slide, please. Similarly, in Europe, they're doing a study where they're comparing the use of carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone with or without stem cell transplantation uh, for patients eligible for transplant. If I really want to go crazy with you is to say the future might be, in addition to that, adding daratumumab, the monoclonal antibody directed against CD38, which has now been approved in the United States in the relapse setting and is quite likely going to come to the upfront setting in the near future. So from frontline therapy, we've concluded that VTD is probably better than CR, uh, Cybor-D. Obviously, VRD, as we've shown to you, is better than, than bortezomib dex alone. KRD gives you the deepest response. Whether or not it's the best strategy or not, we don't know. A cheaper alternative could be the cyclone regimen that I showed you. Transplant is still the standard of care, and, tr and there is deepening of response with time. This idea that only four cycles have to be given is now been changed that we have drugs that people can receive for a longer period of time. Next slide, please. So I, I summarize the future of myeloma with this uh, uh, image that I created to demonstrate that we have four major pillars of myeloma care right now. Proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, the newest monoclonal antibodies, and I'm happy to answer questions about those in detail, and the alkylator therapy of which we use malfolan the most. I would then suggest that on the outside we have four, if you will, minor pillars that support these major pillars that we can use uh, to care for our patients. We don't do it right now, but the day is likely going to come in the near future where the strategy for upfront therapy includes all four. So we might pair all of these together. And again, I'm very sensitive that this may not be available, obviously, to you here in Indonesia, but I want to give you a sense of where the field is going and what ultimately we can advocate for here in your public system. So another way that I represent this is as follows, that we have these options presently available to us, but we're going to have many more. And I could give you 
an hour-long talk or hours of talks on uh, checkpoint inhibitors and PD-1 inhibition and uh, nuclear transport inhibitors and various other uh, mechanisms of drugs that we're likely going to see influence the future of myeloma care. So these are the group of physicians. I'm based in Arizona, of course, and I work with this group, but we have a large group in Rochester, Minnesota, and another group in Florida, and we're very blessed to, uh, to work together to be the largest myeloma group uh, in the world. I will stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.